If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to James chapter 4. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you don't receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the word of God. Father, thank you for the many blessings and things of, of thankfulness that we have. Father, we thank you for the country that we live in. That while there are frustrations and there are complaints, and Father, we know this country is not a godly country, we do thank you for the freedoms that you give us. Thank you for the richness and the, the blessedness that you have poured over us. Father, we thank you for our families and, and for the church family. And Father, we thank you for our salvation and, and for all that you have given us. Lord, we thank you for this church and we thank you for the health that you've given us. So many things, Father, that, that we can be thankful for and that we can... Uh, praise your name for. Lord, we thank you that we can sing your praises and that we can listen to godly music. And Father, we thank you for all of the things uh, of earth. We thank you for the beauty and the awesome weather you've given us this fall. And we thank you for the bountiful harvest that you've bestowed upon us this year. And we, we just thank you for all that you've given. And Father, as we continue to look into this book, I pray that these practical applications would uh, seep into our lives and that we would find when we look back in a year from now we would say thank you for teaching us that we could look and we could see how you have molded us and, and shaped us and made us more like Christ Father thank you for this book and we thank you for this passage and we thank you for all the work that you're going to do in us this morning and I pray that you would open our eyes that you would open our hearts that we would hear from what you have to say to us Father, thank you. We praise you for all things in Christ's name. Amen. It would seem, like every week as we look into this book, that there is more and more that I have to rethink about myself. More that I need to re-examine with my own life. Now, we have seen the test of our speech and the test of the source for our wisdom in chapter 3. Last week, we began to look at the test of lust our passions, our desires, where do they stem from? James began by asking about the infighting and, and the quarreling within the church body. Where does that come from? James even calls them adulterers, which is incredibly strong language, showing how important of a subject these things are. These things are not like a paper cut that is annoying for an hour, but these things are vital to the health and the growth of of the church and the health and the growth of every believer. We need to examine our hearts and we need to seek the Lord in these things. We need to apply these truths so that on Monday at work, we are able to shine the light of the gospel in that workplace, in the classroom, at school, wherever it is God has placed you. And so last week, we very quickly saw the test of lust, and I'd like to summarize that for you because it really connects uh, and is a part of what we're about to look at this morning. In verse 1, James asks the question, where does this infighting come from? And he answers it right away. It says that it comes from our lusts, our desires, our own selfish ambition, a phrase that was used in describing the worldly wisdom at the end of chapter 3. In verses 2 and 3, we saw how our lusts impact our prayers and the things that we pray for. In verses 4 and 5, we see where these lusts and these passions come from. It is a friendship with the world. It's not just a, a connection. This is a relationship 
with the world. And we all struggle with that in various ways. But this relationship puts strain on our relationship with God. To be friends with the world is effectively cheating on God. God desires that we love him with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our strength, with all of our mind. How can we love him with all of our being, every ounce of energy, if we are friendly with the world? Chapter 3's closing verses were describing the wisdom that comes from the world. And if we are showing those kinds of so-called wisdom, then we have become too close with the world and we are therefore not truly loving God. As we said last week, we cannot have both. We cannot claim to be followers of Jesus and yet love the world and the things that are in the world. We cannot say that we are Christians and live like the world. It is one or the other. Verse 5 closes with a little bit of debate among commentators and scholars. But James's point is the same, that our spirit tends toward lust and envy and unfaithfulness to God. I remember driving a car one time and I hit a pothole. Now, it wasn't on the Elgin Road, though. That would be certainly appropriate. But when I hit that pothole, it messed up the alignment. And it messed it up so bad that if I let go of the steering wheel, the car would veer off the road towards the ditch. And so I constantly had to keep the steering wheel tilted. I'm sure many of you are familiar with that kind of thing. The car was out of alignment, and that is us. Our sin nature has us constantly pulling into the ditch, and we cannot keep it from veering. We need the Lord to keep us straight. We need godly wisdom, and while we yearn and while we veer out of alignment, God is faithful. Also, the fact is, is that the Holy Spirit yearns for our devotion. God desires us to have that exclusive monogamous relationship with him. This morning, as we consider what we looked at last week, we see a word that changes everything. And that word is grace. In verse 6, we read, but he gives more grace. I don't know if there's anything as comforting as this short phrase, that God gives more grace. If there is anything that I need it's more grace. When we consider the closeness with the world and the dangers that that causes, there is grace. So there are a couple of things to consider when it comes to this word grace that I want to look at. A couple of questions. Firstly, what is grace? And then secondly, perhaps obviously, who gives grace? Grace is defined as unmerited or undeserved favor. It is different than mercy you see, grace is getting that which we don't deserve, whereas mercy is not getting what we do deserve. Uh, Charles Hodge was a great theologian. Probably none of you have heard of him. Uh, but he wrote this, quote, Grace is love exercised towards the unworthy. Grace is love exercised, practiced towards the unworthy. We don't deserve grace. We deserve justice. God gives grace, firstly, to the unsaved as he offers salvation. We don't deserve salvation. We can't earn favor with God. There is no work, no prayer, no ability that can bring us to salvation. It is a work of grace. It is that love that God shows towards us. We can look at Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. Or this verse, Romans 5, 8. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is grace. That even though we are sinners, totally lost, unable to reach God, he gives grace. He extends his love toward the sinner to such an extent that Christ died for us. But not only is God's grace extended in salvation, but also in our daily walk with him as believers, in our lives, practically. Our verse about grace is not speaking of salvation. Remember, he's talking to fellow believers. But he's speaking of the grace given to us as we live in this world and too often find ourselves in bed with the world. You see, God gives grace to the unsaved 
and he gives grace to the saved. He gives grace to all. When we consider the fact that James is telling us not to be friends with the world, it is because we often are. And that friendship not only creates a conflict, but it produces a hatred and opposition to God. The word given in verse 4 is the word enmity or hostility. And yet God is gracious. He continues to show love and kindness and he continues to work within us to bring growth into our lives. That is grace. That God would continue to strive with me day by day is absolutely amazing. Amazing grace. Consider the words to that famous hymn, Amazing Grace. We know them well, but I want us to think just a little bit deeper about what the author is suggesting. I'm going to pull up the first verse. You can read that while I uh, tell you a little bit about the author, John Newton. Many of you know John Newton and probably know some of his history. He was not a nice fellow. By his own admission, he was a reprobate. At a, at a very, very young age, his mom, who was a godly lady, passed away. And he was sent to boarding school. He lived a terrible life. It was wrought by sin. His desire was to be a sailor. And by 11 years old, had made six voyages as a sailor with his father. He was pressed into the British Navy. And on one occasion, he attempted to desert. And I stress the word attempted because he was caught. The thing is... When he was caught in front of 350 of his uh, uh, crewmates, he was stripped down to the waist and he was flogged eight dozen times. And he was then demoted. He was so humiliated by this that he seriously contemplated murdering the captain and then committing suicide. It wasn't too long after this that Newton was taken into slavery. He was a slave. After more time had passed, he escaped slavery, and then, as most of you probably know, became a slave trader himself. It was during that time that Newton's life began to change. And the thing that I want to stress, because many of us know the story, but we often miss, is the reality of what those words meant as he penned them. How gracious is a God who would save a man like John Newton. You see, we revere Newton because he worked tirelessly after his salvation to take down the slave trade. He worked uh, a lot with Mr. Wilberforce. And we look up to him because of this beautiful song that he wrote. But consider the words and consider this man, but how he felt about grace. Verse 1 says, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I was once lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Consider this man. I want to read verse 3. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Tis grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. You see, John Newton understood grace. He understood that grace uh, in salvation, as God saved him, a man who most certainly did not deserve it. But he also understood grace, and in the process of sanctification, the process of growth as a Christian. It leads us to the question, who gives grace? Grace is getting what we don't deserve, but who is it that gives that grace? Now, we've already kind of answered that, that it's God is the one who gives this grace. And this is key because we don't get grace from the world. Look at the way the world scorns and mocks and tears down. It doesn't take long to look at the entertainment news, which I don't, but it doesn't take long to see how people respond to those who have posted things in the past and how that affects their future. There is no grace given to them. They are fired, they are blackballed, etc., for things that happened many years ago. Now, I'm not saying that there shouldn't be any punishments for these kinds of things. There are actors and actresses that have done terrible things and they deserve to be punished and, and all of that. I'm not here to debate the rights and wrongs of the entertainment business. That's for another day. But my point is that there is never any grace from the world. Some of these things are very serious and yet there is no grace. You can see this difference in our passage but he gives more grace. No one else does. 
but he does. God gives more grace. Every time we fail, God is there to help us back up. And if he can give more grace to me every day, more and more grace, then how can I not but give grace to those around me? The only way I can give grace is by considering the grace that has been bestowed upon me. As we continue, we see that James quotes from the scriptures to back up his claim. This quote could be from a couple of different passages. Firstly, in Psalm 138, verse 6, we read, For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he knows from afar. The word haughty being proud. In Proverbs 3.34, we read, Toward the scorners, he is scornful, but to the humble, he gives favor. Now we can see that this is not a direct quote, but it's certainly uh, relevant. We also see this theme throughout the scriptures, that pride is an unacceptable mindset. That humility is a key factor in this passage. Throughout the book already, we have seen this opposition to pride. In chapter 1, we see humility in action as we are to ask for wisdom. The proud don't ask for anything. We also see in chapter 1 the encouragement to listen to the word of God. And again, we see that the proud do not listen. They are not hearers, for they feel like they know everything already. Pride gets in the way in chapter 2 of showing no partiality. And the pride as they rely upon their works. We see in chapter 3 how pride is a mark of the worldly wisdom that we are to avoid. There is no pride found when one is truly seeking the Lord. Humility is a key component of the Christian life. Jesus himself, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, lives a humble life. He was not proud. He was not arrogant. He was not puffed up. Jesus, the Son of God, the Savior, does not stick out his chest, but he is meek and lowly and humble. You see, what James is getting at is that all of these tests can only be done when we are truly humble. If we are humble, we won't be fighting with one another. If we are humble, we will seek after godly wisdom. Along with humility comes submission. James tells us that we need to submit to God. We need to be placed under his authority. Not only do we submit, but we also resist. This word resist means to stand against, to oppose. We need to stand against the devil. We need to realize that there is a devil and that he is prowling like a lion and he is truly seeking any whom he may devour. Satan is looking to take you down, to make you ineffective. It tells us a few things. First, that Satan is real. And he hates you. And he hates God. Satan is actively opposing God's plans. The second thing we need to know is that Satan will not win. And that Satan can only do what God allows him to do. We see that in action in Job's life. The third thing is is that we are able to oppose Satan's plans and we can resist him, but in order to do so, we must submit to God. The key in not becoming friends with the world, the key in resisting the devil is by submitting to Christ. Satan has a measure of authority over the world and the world systems, the, the culture, and we see his hold over our culture today. And so to be friendly with the world is to be friendly with the devil. And to be friendly with the devil means that our gospel witness is shunted. It is no longer effective. We need to submit to God. It means to be obedient to. The Greek word actually means to place under in an orderly fashion. James is saying that we need to place God above everything else in our lives. He is to be number one. And so my desires are placed under his authority. My passions and my wants and my likes and my dislikes are all put under his subjection. And when we do this, when we humble ourselves and we give everything to God, then our desires are filtered through his lens. And we begin to take on his desires. Here's an example. When I was a kid, I can remember thinking about what I would want to be when I grow up. One of those answers was a teacher. In 
And having placed that desire under subjection, it brought me to the place where I still desire to teach, but it is the word of God. It is the spiritual truths that I desire to teach. And so God uses our desires, and he molds them, and he changes us so that our desires are used to serve him and not ourselves. The closer we cling to God, the further away the devil will be. The more we resist the devil, the more he will flee. However, this submission and resistance is a daily, even hourly at times, process. It is not a Sunday decision that lasts for a week, but we all know how hard it is to resist the devil and to submit to God. It is so easy to let pride come back, to let the world attract our attention, to let the devil deceive us. We are not left to deal with our passions and desires on our own. How thankful we can be that God gives more grace. His grace is sufficient Paul would say that even though Paul was dealing with that thorn in the flesh, whether that was physical or spiritual or mental, Paul understood that God's grace was enough. It was sufficient. John MacArthur said this, quote, The only ray of hope in man's spiritual darkness is the sovereign grace of God, which alone can rescue man from his propensity to lust for evil things. When I consider the fact that I am a pastor, all I can think is of how gracious God is, how God could use me of all people. We need to recognize who we truly are, how sinful we truly are, and the blessing that God gives as he bestows grace upon grace. The truth is, as your pastor, I don't deserve your grace. I don't deserve your compassion and the love that you show on my family but I am ever grateful for it. When we consider the grace of God that we, that should be our attitude. Too often I have become friends with the world. Too often I have committed spiritual adultery with the Savior, against my Savior. I do not deserve His grace. And yet it is His grace bestowed on me that brings not only salvation, but service. We can have a relationship with God. Not just salvation, but a lifetime of grace. Grace is not just sufficient in salvation, but His grace is sufficient and abundant in our daily lives. No matter where we are today, no matter how worldly you have become, seek God's grace today. Satan might have tied you down. He might have you sinking in quicksand, but resist him and humble yourself before God. You might be thinking, I'm too far gone. Look at where I am. God can't use me. Those are lies from Satan. Resist him and submit. Place God as the sole priority in your life. Place God above your spouse, above your children, above your grandchildren. Put God first. Serve him. Love him with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Pursue godliness and flee from temptation. Avoid pride and envy and selfish ambition and run to God today. Father, I pray that as we consider the, the topic of grace, that you would continue to show your grace to us. That even the breath upon my lungs is because of your grace. Father, thank you that you have bestowed grace upon us in salvation. And I pray that any that might be here that have not known your salvation, that they would place their faith in you today, that you would show your grace upon them and that they would be converted, that they would be uh, called a son of God. Father, I pray that you would help us as believers to rely upon your grace, upon grace, upon grace. That in our daily lives, as we go through and we fail so many times, I pray that you would continue to give grace. And we thank you for your grace. Father, I pray that you would help us to resist the devil. Father, help us to take a stand against him. To take a stand against the cultural norms of our day. Father, help us 
to show grace to others. That while this world is graceless and harsh, I pray that we would show grace and forgiveness and love even to those who are considered unlovable. Father, help us to show grace. Help us to recognize your grace in our lives and help us as we recognize your grace to to extend that to others. Father, we thank you for this day and we thank you for Thanksgiving. We thank you that we can be thankful in all circumstances. We ask that you would lead and guide in our lives. Father, help us to see your grace this morning. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.